Hi, Graham. It's Dr. Roy. Uh, here's your case. I wanted to share with you uh, the updated thoughts on how we could navigate this plan without removing teeth. Uh, based on some new technology uh, that I had shared with you during our consultation, I think the way I would do this if I were you is to, <clears throat> is to do this without removing any teeth. Excuse me. <clears throat> so the way we're going to do this or the way I'm proposing we do this is to use uh, what's called an MSC device. We had talked about this. Um, you had mentioned that phonetics is important for your job, so having something in your mouth um, permanently might be a hindrance. Uh, but I just don't see patients struggling with these. Um, I've had really good reports of the few cases I've done so far. Uh, I plan on doing it myself, and any of the literature and courses I've heard and seen about this suggest that this is the least impeding palate expander out there, and it also happens to be one of the best, if not the best. So it's called the MSC, if you want to do some research on it. Um, maxillary skeletal expander. Um, MARPI is another name for it. This is a subtype of the MARPI, which is a mini screw assisted rapid palatal expander. Um, I don't think you need to get too far into the weeds. There's four different uh, titanium screws which anchor this into place so that this mini jack screw in between when you I'll give you a key and you turn this will help expand the arch. Um, the teeth are anchored here or the um, the device is anchored by the teeth here. Um, it gives us true expansion. And the reason why I think that's important, if we come over here and we look at your CAT scan, uh, just to give you some frame of reference, this is your nose right here. Here's the roof of your mouth. There's your upper teeth, lower teeth, and then mandible. And that this slice, this is a two-dimensional slice of a three-dimensional situation, is right here. Where these are your front teeth, this is your airway, and that's your spine. So we're about halfway through. And normally when we make a measurement here, the distance between these two teeth is somewhere on the order of like 40 millimeters. You're at 28. So my thought is if we remove teeth, we're not going to be taking advantage of the opportunity to widen the palate so that the tongue lives in the in the mouth with less restriction or constriction another advantage to this technique and before i go too much farther the the screws go right here okay so they they go in the roof of the mouth they don't hurt so there's not much you have to worry about that it's, it sounds painful but it's not but they go in the roof of the mouth and they anchor right at the bottom of the nose which gives us additional nasal breathing effects so we had talked a lot about <clears throat> the capacity of nasal breathing the importance of nasal breathing and I'm looking at your turbinates here. These are the balloons of soft tissue that live in our, our nose. Um, not ideal. You also have a deviated septum, which is blocking some airflow. So the reason I bring this up is if we expand, we're actually going to increase the volume of, of uh, free space so that you can breathe better. Um, <clears throat> let me just show you what the rest of your nose looks like. So I'm looking in this area right here as I pan through. So you can see that deviated septum right here, a couple spurs. So the point of bringing this up, by expanding your palate, we're going to be expanding your nose. I know I'm being redundant here, but redundant for effect. Um, I think at some point we'd want to get you to the ENT to take a look at that deviated septum. Uh, as we talked about, breathing is everything. Um, highly recommend that book, Breathe by James Nestor. So you can also see the lower teeth, how far tilted they are. So we're going to use Invisalign on the lower to upright those. We'll have lower trays while we're doing upper expansion. Coming back over here. So we'll be working on the crowding on the lower while we're expanding on the upper. Um, if you're open to this approach, I may want to do some anterior trays where we actually have Invisalign from here, probably here all the way across to here. The reason for that is if we're going to straighten the lower teeth, we need to create space on the upper. So we might have to do a little bit of staging where we do some Invisalign on the upper, maybe pause it for a little bit, uh, depending upon how you're doing with the Invisalign tray plus the expander. Uh, maybe you can give me some guidance on on how you might want to do this. One, one approach would be for us to do some Invisalign first, maybe for six months. Then we do the expander, 
primarily on the upper and then finish the case with Invisalign thereafter. So there's lots of iterations to it, but I don't want to get too stuck in the weeds until you give me the green light that you're okay with the appliance, um, this guy here. Uh, of note, if the appliance is working well, we start to see spacing between the front teeth. That is temporary, and you actually have quite a bit of space, so I don't think we're going to see a whole lot of that because your teeth are already crowded. So any space that's created here will actually most likely be occupied by the tooth as it comes forward. With that said, not everybody responds like that, so you have to be prepared for uh, a little bit of, of the, uh, what do we call that, the Michael Strahan effect. Um, if that's a game changer for you, let me know. We can work around that if needed. It just adds more time to the treatment. <clears throat> I haven't had any patients have a hard time with that, in great part because when they see it, they know it's working. Um, I also wanted to share this here. Uh, this was the original plan proposed uh, for the Invisalign trays, but we have a tool that measures uh, the width of all of your teeth. And this tells me that when the teeth are all straight, you might have an overjet. An overjet is essentially kind of a, a space between the upper and lower teeth. Um, that's overjet. And then as we move forward, we decrease overjet. This plan was um, built removing some of the teeth, so we don't see that overjet here. I share this with you because once we get closer to the end, we may have to have a conversation about how to fix the overjet. Um, there's lots of ways of doing it. We're most likely gonna resolve all of that through the treatment alone, but I just wanna bring your attention to that. Uh, we might have to have that discussion. Some patients leave it, others don't, but I, I strongly feel that Having that conversation at this stage of the game is non-productive. Just over the years, I've um, learned what's important for patients to think about early on in cases. That's not gonna change whether you do it or not. It's just gonna increase your awareness that we might have to have that conversation. So that's pretty much it. Um, <clears throat> please share with me your thoughts, concerns, questions, uh, and then we can go from there. Um, if you're open to it, I'll give you more clarity on exactly the timing of it. When does the appliance go in and how do we get to the finish line as efficiently as possible but give you the maximum outcome? All right, hope all is well and I look forward to hearing from you.